Recorded live. Good evening, everybody out there. This is Jörg Lissmann from YouTube channel Jockler66 once again on the broadcast from uh, Grand Design Exposed Talk Show, Hour of the Truth. And um, this is our next broadcast, and I can tell you already right now it will be a lengthy one. Not only this broadcast, but uh, especially what all comes to here, I think we have to do more than one because we really took a lot on to tell you people all about. First of all, I want to remember you of the motto of the show of Hour of the Truth. And that is also something that you will see today in our broadcast subject that comes up, that Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and sent out their crusades. Times and methods may have changed. The goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible-believing people who uphold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. That is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth, and today we have Thursday, the 16th of April, 2015, meaning we have some five months to go before the Antichrist, Pope Francis, will visit the United States of America and speak on behalf of the American people at the joint session of Congress on 24th of September, I think that is. And in the way going to September 2015, there are a lot of articles that the Vatican um, publishes about what Pope Francis is all doing. And I think that a lot of these articles will also be reflected in the things that he has to say there. So without any further ado, I will first of all welcome my guest for tonight, and that is Tom Press from Inquisition Update. You probably know him from earlier broadcasts, and if not, you have really missed something, and I want you to watch these broadcasts up, uh, whether on the MP3, on the website, Hour of the Truth, or, of course, via the videos I made on Jogler 66. Anyway, Tom, very much, a very heartily welcome to our broadcast tonight. How are you doing? Good evening, Yerk. I'm doing fine, and good evening, and uh, welcome to your listeners. I'm anxious to uh, get into the subject matter this evening. Yes, and even though I haven't given a name to the subject matter, everybody will see what it's going about. But I will start first uh, reading an article from the Catholic News Agency, uh, published on, in Vatican City on March 6, 2015. So that's about a month ago. And that article is called, Church Unity is Found in Christ, Eucharist, Pope Francis tells bishops. Aha, uh-huh. Church Unity is Found in Christ, comma, Eucharist. Aha. Uh-huh. So Eucharist and Christ are the same, of course, to the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start reading, or do you have a comment already on the topic, uh, Tom? Oh, no, go right ahead. Okay, then I'm going to read along now. Pope Francis on Wednesday reminded bishops to turn their sights to the Eucharists rather than themselves as the source of unity for the church. Quote, the bishop does not gather people around himself or his own ideas, but around Christ, present in his word and in the sacrament of his body and blood, end quote. The Pope said March 4th during an audience with bishops taking part this week in a gathering at the Focolare movement. Quote, the bishop is the principle of unity in the church, but this does not take place without the Eucharist, he says. Otherwise, quote, unity would lose its divine pole of attraction and would be reduced a solely human, physiological, and sociological dynamic, end quote. Some 60 prelates from around the world have been meeting in Castel Gandolfo March 3rd to March 6th on the 38th Conference of Bishop Friends of the Focolare Movement, which is centered on the theme, Eucharist Mystery of Communion. The Focolare Movement was founded in 1943 to promote the ideals of unity and universal fraternity. Representatives from what Pope Francis described as, quote-unquote, bloody lands, of Syria, Iraq, and Ukraine, their citizens are, fac- are facing severe politically and religiously motivated violence, were among those present at the gathering at the Vatican's Paul VI Hall. Greeting these participants in particular, Pope Francis offered them encouragement that 
through Jesus in the Eucharist, they might have the, quote, strength to move forward in the faith and hope, unquote. In the daily celebration of the Mass, we are united to you. We pray for you offering the sacrifice of Christ, and from it the many initiatives of solidarity in favor of your churches gain their strength and significance, the Pope went on to say. Focolaris President and Co-President Maria Voce and Jesus Moran, respectively, were also present at the audience. The charism of the Focolare movement is, quote, strongly anchored to the Eucharist, unquote, Pope Francis told participants gathered in the audience hall. Quote, the Eucharist guarantees that Christ be at the center, unquote, with the Holy Spirit directing, quote, our steps and initiatives toward encounter and communion, unquote, he said. In the school of Jesus, the bishop gathers the sheep entrusted to him with the offering of his life, himself taking on a form of Eucharist existence, Pope Francis continued. And, quote, so the bishop conformed to Christ becomes a living gospel, becomes bread broken for the life of many with his preaching and his witness. He who is nourished with faith in Christ, the living bread, is urged on by his love to give his life for the brothers and sisters to go out, to go to meet those who are marginalized and despised. End quote. Well, it was quite a lengthy article, but I think I didn't have read anything that comes right from the Bible, except from the Bible of Satan, of course, maybe the Roman Catholic one. <laughs> Tom, I would like to hear your comments on this Eucharist, unity, and even the bishop becoming the bread of life, as he stated here. Well, Jörg, you already, you already stated the obvious. Uh, a point, obvious as it is, might be missed by some of the listeners. And that is that there's not one single stitch of this that comes from the Bible. This is the Roman Catholic Church. And Pope Francis is literally saying that Christian unity lies in the participation of the Mass. Now, the Eucharist, uh, a name that might be unfamiliar, a word that might be unfamiliar to some of your listeners, but the Eucharist is that unique piece of bread uh, that the priest holds in his hand and raises up and proclaims a Latin, uh, a Latin statement, hoc est in his corpus meus, which means this is the body of Christ. And at that point, the substance of the bread is believed in the Roman Catholic Church to change from bread, uh, from flour and water, to the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Jesus. And then it is sacrificed once again on the altar. They call it a blood sacrifice, a bloodless sacrifice, but quote unquote, the self same sacrifice that took place upon the cross. It is a literal re sacrifice of Christ. And that, which I call, and rightly so, an abomination, uh, is to be the centerpiece of the unity of the church, the quote-unquote church, which means to the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and no one else. And to be considered a Christian and to be unified with the Christian body one must participate in the sacrifice of the Mass, an abomination. Now, what else this article does, it places the, the, the center of authority in the Roman Catholic Church, first of all, to the Pope, which the Roman Catholic Church claims is Jesus Christ hidden behind a veil of flesh, and then secondly, to the bishops. 
to, to focus, to center the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, individual churches, in the local bishop. Okay? So the bishops are instructed by this article to take charge over the Mass and to take charge over the local priests and to make sure that they conform to the Roman Catholic Church's recipe for the Mass. In other words, to make sure that every priest comes in line with the teaching of the bishop or else. And by just by, uh, you know, simple logic, we know that the so-called evangelical churches, which are now ecumenically reunited with this Roman Catholic Church in various degrees, are also being told that the Eucharist will be the center of that new unity, that new ecumenical unity. And, of course, by, by, uh, by common sense, we also must realize that if the whole Christian world now, by proclamation of this pope, must participate, if they wish to be in unity with that church, must participate in the Mass, we also must know that the Mass must take place on Sunday or in veneration of Sunday. And uh, there's a lot in this, uh, there's a lot in this article that were one a true Protestant would be horrified by because it is this so-called tradition this diabolical tradition of the Roman Catholic Church, which became an issue during the Protestant Reformation, knowing that the only person in the Roman Catholic Church who can miraculously change the substance of the bread into the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ and to sacrifice him again on the altar of the Roman Catholic Church is the Roman Catholic priest. And only the Roman Catholic priest. He is the only one who possesses the power, so-called, to change the substance of the bread into the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ, which renders every ecumenical, uh, ecumenical evangelical or any ecumenical so-called Protestant that they've lost all the power, that only the Roman Catholic priest has the power to preside over the Mass. Either that or the Roman Catholic Church is going to have to uh, somehow include the ecumenical uh, uh, evangelicals, the pastors of the ecumenical evangelical churches, the power to change the, 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 uh, the bread into the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ to sacrifice him again on the altar. Conformity to the Mass is what is being called for by this article. This completely undoes the Protestant Reformation. It assumes that the Protestant Reformation was an unwarranted rebellion against the true church, the quote-unquote true church of Jesus Christ, the apostolic, the one holy Roman Catholic church outside of which there is no salvation, according to Roman Catholic canon law and the decrees of the popes. And this is the very reason why the Protestant Reformers, one of the very reasons why the Protestant Reformers denounced the papacy as the Antichrist of the Bible, the little horn of Daniel, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible. And on that basis, they rebelled against the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, but now that that uh, that rebellion is being brought under control, and the control uh, uh, and the sub- and the uh, the overthrow of Protestantism is being exercised or implemented and enforced by the civil powers, by the governments. And uh, only time will prove my assertion to be correct. But more and more and more, you'll see government getting involved in the religious worship of citizens and those who do not 
conform to the quote-unquote unity of the church, participation in the mass, subservience to the bishops, they will be more and more regarded as rebellious and in nonconformity and will be held under such terms as ancient as is ancient in Christianity, heretic. And, of course, the modern permutation of the word heretic is now domestic terrorist and uh, or radical fundamentalist. That's a term they've used to demonize the Muslims. It will now apply to God's people, Bible-believing Christians. Christians not in name only, but in practice. And it is they who will rebel. As few as they may be, it is they who will rebel against this call for this Eucharistic unity. It is those who will rebel against the so-called authority of the bishops and the authority of the priests, and they will hold true to the written word of God. There is no more sacrifice for sin. Christ is our sacrifice. He is our propitiation. It was a bloody sacrifice. Only the shedding of blood remits sin, and it was done once and for all. And now, with that understanding, one can understand why the Eucharist is an abomination before the Lord, and God's people will never submit. And uh, here we have the, the line being drawn in the sand between the unity of the so-called church and the heretics the Bible believers, the true faith of Jesus Christ. Back to you, Jörg. Yes, Tom, what you mentioned actually is how Rome is seeing here in this article how Rome changes the truth. And Rome does not only change the truth, Rome only changes laws and times. That is something that we have been spoken of already when we did our broadcast on characteristics of Antichrist. How Rome changed times and laws was one of the 26 characteristics how to identify the Antichrist, because the Antichrist is not Obama, the Antichrist is not Prince Charles or uh, this newborn king, I don't know, uh, Prince what's, whatever is his name over there in, uh, in England, or whatever people think the Antichrist is not some, uh, it's not Islam or uh, the Muslims or, or whatever they think about, but the Antichrist is the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist is the Pope of Rome, has always been and will always be. And he thinks to change times and laws. And there's a very interesting article that was sent to me by, uh, I don't know whether it was Walt or it was Dave, I don't remember anymore. But that's very interesting, and um, we will go a little bit deeper into that right now. Because you also mentioned uh, very, uh, very shortly in your explanation that you did right there uh, about the Sunday law, the coming sun Sunday law. And we over here in Europe, where I live, of course, I live in the heart of the Holy Roman Empire or here, over here. And here they also, of course, want to make the people to worship on a special day that they present to the people. And this brings us to the same question that we were talking about when we were doing this broadcast um, on, uh, on the forum Nothing But The Truth at that time, that was called the Sabbath question. Why didn't the reformers go all the way? And we dealt with the Sabbath, and the seventh-day Sabbath, which is Saturday and not Sunday. And this enforcing of the Sunday law, which many people see as mark of the beast, um, and of course, when you know some, uh, some quotes, even coming from the Roman Catholic Church itself, the Roman Catholic Church itself says that Sunday is their mark. Now, I am over here living in Europe, in Belgium, which is a very Catholic country. I think it's a little bit more than 50% of the whole population is Catholic, and that's, that's a lot, seeing that you also have a few other denominations, and 50% and then it's probably the majority about it. Um, uh, they already formed the European Union as a second Holy Roman Empire, as so to speak, uh, compared to the Holy Roman Empire that they had in the time uh, until the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1800-something. There was this 
thousand year Reich that started with Charlemagne in 800 something until 1800 something, so that's thousand years. That was the first Holy Roman Empire here in Europe. And now we have with the European Union, the second Holy Roman Empire. And now we have a Pope who is a Jesuit, I remind you, who has the title Pontifex Maximus, which translate as the bridge builder. He coming from South America, now reigning in Rome, in Europe, will go to visit the United States of America, building another bridge between the continents of Europe and America. That's what he is doing. Now, what article am I talking about? The article is called uh, The First European Interest Group Work-Life Balance is Launched. This comes from the European Sunday Alliance. Listen carefully, European Sunday Alliance. I'm going to read the article right now, or is there something that you want to add to the explanation that I gave already up to here, Tom? Is there something you want to add to me? Yes, just a reiteration of what I said before. The unity of the church, the so-called church, is to be in the Eucharist, the sacrifice of the Mass, overseen by the bishop, and the result will be a Sunday law to make law that one must observe Sunday as the Sabbath against the Scripture. The Scripture says the seventh day is the Sabbath, and uh, that being Saturday. And it's the day that the Jews have perpetually observed as the Sabbath. It's the day that all Protestant Sabbatarians observed, Saturday, the seventh day, the end of the week. But Rome changed that. And it was done in the third century, or rather the fourth century. And uh, Christianity, whether Protestant or otherwise, has followed Rome's tradition in observance of Sunday, for which there is no scriptural uh, backing whatsoever. And on the basis of the tradition, as established by the Roman Catholic Church in the observance of Sunday, Europe now, che- now sees an opportunity to make Sunday worship the law of the land, conformity to Roman Catholic canon law and tradition, against the scriptures. The whole world wonders after the beast. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, I think that uh, our listeners really have to pay attention now when I read this article. Of course, I will include that in the video as a link over there, that they can read it for themselves, but I'm going to read it right now. The first European interest group, Work-Life Balance, is launched from the 3rd of March 2015, so that's only uh, some a month ago. On the very day when the European Day for a Work-Free Sunday is celebrated across Europe at the European Parliament, and in the presence of members of European parliaments from different political groups, the European Sunday Alliance launched the first European interest group on work-life balance. For the first time, the interest group, supported by representatives of politicians, trade unions, business executives, family and sport organizations, and representatives of churches and religious communities, brought together 50 people to discuss how to ensure that EU legislation respects and promotes workers' health and promotes a better balance between family and private life and work. Participants shared the consensus that these objectives do not conflict with the objective of economic competitiveness. In the contrary, competitiveness needs innovation. Innovation needs creativity. Creativity needs recreation. I'm going to stop the reading right here because this, what I've just read here, especially the last sentence, is a wonderful example of Jesuit casuistry and sophistry. Tom, please. Yes, first of all, like the previous article, there's not one mention of Scripture. There's only mention of the European Parliament to which all the governments of Europe must submit to its authority. They've given up their national sovereignty. They've given up their Protestantism, in effect. And now Parliament dictates. And Parliament, the European Parliament, being an agent of Rome, is now free 
to legislate for all of Europe over and above the so-called or once enjoyed sovereignty of the individual nations where Protestantism ruled and reigned, and now they make Sunday a law. Sunday observance must be a law. And they never mention the Roman Catholic Church here. They're doing it so-called in the interest of uh, workers' health and the promotion of balance between family and private life and work. No mention of Rome whatsoever, but this is Rome's agenda to get everybody in subservience to the papacy, to observe their so-called Sabbath, the first day of the week, as in contradistinction to God's Sabbath, which is the seventh day of the week, and also to take God's people out of Europe, to take them out from under Christ's authority and the authority of the Scriptures and place them under Rome's authority. And the enforcer of Rome's authority will be the EU Parliament and the local governments of the nations of Europe in, in communion with her will be, will be authorized to take whatever corrective measure is needed to ensure that this Sunday law is observed. Now, you've heard one denomination of Christianity, which is generally referred by many people as a cult, have been suggesting for years and years and years that the bottom line, the, the eventual uh, the eventual plan of Rome is to get everyone in conformity with a Sunday law, to make Sunday the law of the land. And it's, it's happening. This is true. It, it's coming to pass. And who would have thought otherwise if one recognizes that Rome is, that the papacy is the Antichrist of the Bible? Who, would, who in the world would have the power to conform all of the Christian world into Sunday observance by law? Who in the world could do that but the papacy? And that's who's doing it. And he's using the governments of the world to do it. Parliament, the EU Parliament, and the United Nations – and it's all being done under the, under the guise of, of workers' health and the promotion of balance between family and private life and work, when underneath it all is conformity to the Roman Catholic Church and Roman Catholic tradition. Back to you, Yerk. There will be no doubt about what Tom just said after the, reading the rest of the article. The event was held under the patronage of MEPs Evelyn Regner, MEP stands for Member of European Parliament, and Thomas Mann. Last year, many of the MEPs present signed the European Sunday Alliance Pledge. Now, what is that pledge? I'm going to read that for you. Pledge for a work-free Sunday and decent work ahead of the European elections in 2014. Quote, a work-free Sunday and decent working hours are of paramount importance for citizens and workers throughout Europe and are not necessarily in conflict with economic competitiveness. Especially in the present time of socio-economic crisis, the adoption of legislation extending working hours to late evenings, nights, bank holidays and Sundays has direct consequences for the working conditions of employees and for small and medium-sized enterprises. Competitiveness needs innovation. Innovation needs creativity, and creativity needs creation. Now comes the pledge that more than 50 members there pledged already from the European Parliament. Listen carefully. Quote, As a current or future member of the European Parliament, I pledge... Firstly, to ensure that all relevant EU legislation both respects and promotes the protection of a common weekly day of rest for all EU citizens, which shall be in principle on a Sunday, in order to protect workers' health and promote a better balance between family and private life and work. And secondly, to promote EU legislation guaranteeing sustainable working time patterns based on the principle of decent work benefiting society as well 
as the economy as a whole, end quote. This pledge was taken by so-called chosen, so, no, 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 so-called elected, <laughs> but actually more chosen members of parliament. These people are normally there to represent in Strasbourg, in the European Parliament, or in Brussels, in the uh, European capital city, the will of the people, they so-called gave them their vote. I don't know if anybody agrees with that, but I did not agree with this pledge these people just made. But I'm going to continue reading on the other article, but I think this was a very interesting pledge to read and to understand, and Tom will surely go uh, when I finished reading this article into that and the obstrosity that it actually means. So continue reading now in the article of the European Sunday Alliance. The issue of work-life balance, decent working hours and synchronized free, free time for all citizens in Europe is important for many reasons. I mean, don't you hear the communism just speaking out of this here? <laughs> <laughs> At a personal level, for time together with family and friends, social, cultural, and sport or sports activities. At a spiritual one, as a day of rest and religious edification, and above all, to ensure an adequate time of rest. A lack of work-life balance often leads to abs absenteeism, psychosocial stress at work, and burnout. It has a clear negative impact on the economy. Uh, on the economic productivity. The relevance of the topic becomes even more evident as the European Commission, and I have to tell you that if you don't know that maybe over there in America, the European Commission is uh, uh, 12 members or something, and they are chosen, they are not elected by the people, and this is actually the real European government, the European Commission. And the head of the European Commission just um, changed from Hermann von Rompuy, who was a former uh, Belgian uh, prime minister, to uh, Juncker. And he was the former prime minister of Luxembourg. And he has now the title of the uh, European president. So the relevance of the topic becomes even more evident as the European Commission refers in its ongoing public consultation on the review of the Working Time Directive to fundamental changes which have occurred in the world of work and the economy and that impact on many aspects of the organization uh, of working time. The members of the interest groups on work-life balance believe that the current legislation does not sufficiently address the issue of balance between work and private life and does not ensure that workers can enjoy a common weekly day of rest. A thorough reflection and discussion on how to best ensure the protection of EU citizens' work-life balance is therefore urgently needed. Interest Group provides the right format and opportunity to bring members of the European Parliament and representatives from civil society and other organizations together. It will offer a platform, a regular and informal exchange of views, knowledge and expertise on the different aspects and actors involved to ensure a better work-life balance for all. Well, actors, yeah. This was the first of a series of, event, of events that will address the issue on work-life balance and that will continue for two years from now. And this ends the article right here. But I have to say something uh, before I leave Tom uh, giving a comment on this. Um, there is a video out um, that has been published some, some weeks ago that is called See How the Sunday Law is Being Pushed Today. And in that, probably the Roman Catholic Church under the disguise of the European Sunday Alliance um, they will tell you how they shift the seventh-day rest from the, from the biblical Sabbath, Saturday, to Sunday. Um, the video goes about for five minutes or something, and I will add this at the end of the broadcast. 
uh, not here in the broadcast today, but in the video that I will make of that. So at the end of our broadcast, you can watch that video embedded in the video that I'm going to make from this broadcast. So even when you see the, uh, the title going off that that broadcast is done, uh, don't switch off because then you will miss this very, very important video. And now I will ask Tom to give another explanation of what I just read and the implications of all this. So please, Tom. Well, the immediate concern I have is I want the listeners to take notice. There's all this talk linking a common day of rest. In other words, one day set aside that all of Europe acknowledges is the day of rest so that they can, you know, have a better life. Uh, so, you know, a, a, a better family unity, better, you know, it's, it's all about <clears throat> the well-being of the person. But what about the well-being of, Europe, uh, of European citizens who don't regard Sunday as the day of rest. What about all those Europeans who follow God and not the government and observe God's holy Sabbath? What about them? It's putting them into an extreme minority, carefully made distinction of as nonconformists, as rebels against this Sunday Alliance. 50 people, not elected, because if they were elected, then some Protestant might speak up and say, we want a Protestant on this commission. We want someone who will reflect our beliefs that the Scripture is the sole authority for faith and practice, that we as Bible-believing Christians in Europe observe the Bible and that the European Union, the European Commission, if it be godly, must observe God's holy Sabbath and not Sunday. You see, they appoint the people to the commission. They don't elect them so that the Protestant view or the biblical view will have no representation on that commission. And this is implementation of Roman Catholic canon law and tradition and authority by the civil power. And again, I recommend the video, as I often do, by Richard Bennett entitled Roman Control Through Civil Law. Roman Control Through Civil Law. Or Vatican Control Through Civil Law. I correct myself. Vatican Control Through Civil Law. And this is the way it was in the old world order. The Vatican made the decree and imposed its will upon the people through the civil governments of every land. That's precisely what's going on in the United States. That's precisely what's going on in Europe. The Vatican makes the rules. The governments of the world implement those rules. Sunday is the day venerated by the Roman Catholic Church and every Babylonian cult all the way back to the flood. It is in direct rebellion against the Creator and against the conscience of every Bible-believing Christian, yet it is becoming the law of the land of Europe, and it will become the law of the land in this country if God's people do not speak up. But whether we speak up or not, this is going to be brought against us. This is going to be brought to bear upon all of us. And we'll all have a choice to make. Who will we serve? Christ or Antichrist? Back to you, Yerk. That was a very interesting point that you made there, that there is no Protestant in the European Parliament and surely no Protestant in power in the European Parliament. Because we spent the first few broadcasts here on Hour of the Truth on the analysis, uh, analysis of the paper that Richard Bennett wrote on the Catholic Lutheran Accord. We took four broadcasts for that. And in that, we analyzed the paper that was written on the Catholic Lutheran Accord that was formed in 1999 between the Worldwide Lutheran Federation and the Roman Catholic Church. 
that made absolutely clear for people who understand it that since Vatican II that took place between 1962 and 1965 and was the foundation of the ecumenical movement and was a, um, how do you say that, a confirmation of the Council of Trent instead of a retreat from Council of Trent doctrines, that the Roman Catholic Church in that way embraced their enemy that they couldn't get on, uh, on the battlefield, but then infiltrated them by the ecumenical movement. So when, Tom, you are speaking about Protestants being somewhere in the, uh, in the position of power, whether here in Europe or even over there in the United States of America, there is no difference spiritually between the Reformed Protestant churches the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church after signing that accord. And a few years later, if I'm not mistaken, in 2004, the Worldwide Methodist Federation also signed the Lutheran Accord that the Lutherans signed with the Roman Catholic Church in 1999. So when, when we are speaking about Protestants being in, uh, in the government or being in a position of power, we still have to understand that all these Protestants do not speak the word of God anymore, but they also speak in the word or in the, in the words of the dragon, the Roman Catholic Church. There are no Protestants left in a position of power anywhere around the world right now because all the Protestant denominations have been infiltrated and subversed via the Jesuits and brought back under the wings of Rome. But please elaborate a little bit on this, Tom. Yes. <clears throat> At this point, I'd like to direct people's attention toward the Bible. That's a strange thing, isn't it? I mean, it's never been mentioned in any of these articles. But the Bible, in Romans chapter 13, lays out the responsibility of the civil power. It gives the jurisdiction of the civil power. And... It is mentioned, the second table of the law, how man should relate to man. The Bible says in Romans chapter 13 that the civil power is to reward good and to punish evil, and then limits its jurisdiction to the second table of the law, how man relates to man. In the first table of the law, the first four commandments, and I'll recite them as best I can, I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything in the heavens above or the earth beneath or the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy to the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And it also says the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, neither thou, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in seven days the Lord created the heavens and earth and all that in them is, and he hallowed the seventh day. It's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, the seventh day. That is the first table of the law, man's responsibility to God. And not one of those commandments are given in the 13th chapter of Romans. Get establishing the power and authority, the legitimate power and authority of the civil government. Not one of those first four commandments are included in the jurisdiction and the, leg the legitimate jurisdiction and power and authority of any civil government. No civil government may make an edict regarding any one of those first four commandments. They are to be left under the jurisdiction of God only. But here we have the Sunday Alliance, representing the European Parliament, represented by, by appointees, not elected, 
taking jurisdiction over the Sabbath, the first day of the law, the first uh, table of the law. They are out of order. They have gone beyond their legal, biblical jurisdiction as a civil power and have treaded into the forbidden, the first table of the law. Now, this alone should raise a protest, a protest. Notice I use the word protest, as in Protestant, should lead a Protestant protest all over Europe, as it should all over the United States of America. You know, this Roman power that dictates to us through the civil law, it takes its authority from Romans chapter 13. That's where they justify themselves, and rightly so. That's where God gives the civil power authority. And it should be recognized by every Bible-believing Christian who is familiar with Romans chapter 13 that with this Sunday alliance, the European Union has tread into forbidden territory and is asserting itself over the fourth commandment. That's, That's rebellion. That is rebellion against the throne of Almighty God. Neither the Pope nor the government have the right to tread on the first table of the law. That alone is justification for the overthrow of the European Parliament and of the papacy. And the world just doesn't have the courage. Protestants have no more protest. They've capitulated. And it's going to be Christ. It's going to have to be Christ because no one else has the courage or the gumption or the faith to stand up against this Roman beast. It's Christ who's going to have to come and liberate us just like he liberated the Israelites out of Pharaoh's Egypt. What a sad commentary that God's people don't even recognize that this European Parliament and the civil governments of both Europe and the United States have treaded into forbidden territory and on that basis alone overthrow this Roman horde. If we can't do it, I know one that can. Back to you, Yerk. Yes, Tom, thank you very much. And in the beginning, I stated that we will go into the subject of how Rome changed times and laws. We now have been busy for three quarters of an hour to speak about the law, meaning um, the Ten Commandments, of course, or at least in, uh, in that perspective, the, one of the most discussed law of the Ten Commandments, namely commandment number four, to keep Sabbath holy. We have not addressed yet how he changes the times. So before we go any further on that Sabbath question, there will be, of course, I'm very sure about that, a lot of comments coming on the video um, that I will make of this broadcast. And I can tell you right now, when you do not listen to this broadcast, very carefully and read the same stuff that we read on this broadcast and beyond that, then, of course, you will never be in agreement with us. But if you are in agreement or not, only shows whether you are spiritually honest or spiritually dishonest, because then you're going to use probably some private interpretation of the Bible, and that is something that is not allowed. But anyway, changing about the times, I refer to an article that comes from the website remnantofgod.org from Nicholas. He is a former Seventh-day Adventist. Some 20 years ago, he left the Seventh-day Adventist church anyway. And I want to tell all of our listeners right now, neither Tom, neither Walt, nor I are Seventh-day Adventists. So when we refer to these pages that we get sometimes from the uh, Seventh-day Adventist page of of Nicholas, even though he is not a Seventh-day Adventist anymore, but the site that he set up and he comes out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, doesn't mean that we promote the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but we are looking for documents 
to sustain the truths of the Bible. And if these are found in Seventh-day Adventist papers, then so be it. Also, a lot of the quotes that we will be reading today, and especially the letter that comes later on that deals with the Sabbath question, that is a letter from the Roman Catholic Church itself to Protestants, published in the 19th century. We will also take the quotes from the Roman Catholic Church on this. So you have to see that it doesn't matter where, um, where the quotes come from. Even the Roman Catholic Church uses uh, evidence against itself to make her point. That only she can do because people are so indoctrinated with the humanity, with, 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 with humanism and all that stuff, that they don't see the biblical reference in things like these anymore. So whether you agree with this or you don't agree with it, don't agree with us, just check the facts for yourself that are presented here in another broadcast to you. Um, I will later go on to mention other broadcasts that we did on the same subject when I turn back to the Sabbath. But before that, I will read a part of the page from remnantofgod.org that he made under the uh, Antichrist section of the Roman Catholic uh, Church exposed uh, uh, menu, in his, uh, menu on his site. Um, that is titled, Times and Laws Changed by Rome. And I'm going to start reading a little bit of this. And uh, as I go along, uh, Tom will here and there fill in some more explanation to this. So first I'm going to start reading now on the beginning. So remember that when I read about I in this, uh, in this page, I is Nicholas from Remnant of God, Dardark. Okay? So I'm going to start reading. On this page, I have some overwhelming facts that every Protestant needs to read. If the Protestant Church of today knew what the Catholic Church did in the past regarding the Seventh-day Sabbath, they would not be worshipping on Sundays today. I guarantee that if you are a true child of God, seeking to do exactly as the Creator would have you to do, this information on this page will affect you in a major way. Prophecy states plainly that the beast will seek to change times and laws. And on this page, you will see ample evidence that the Roman Catholic Church admits to that very fact, as I just stated. And before I go on, just a little reminder, we did a broadcast earlier on uh, the Sabbath question, why didn't the reformers go all the way, and that exclusively dealt with the Sabbath question at that time. But I will go to that later again. But uh, again, there's a video that is very important for you to look up and maybe have a look at it. So, the Word of God says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, quote, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. This is what God says. Now, what does Rome say? Quote, The Pope has the power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. The Pope has the authority, and often exercised it, to dispense with the command of Christ. End quote. This is taken from the discretal, the translatic episcope capture. Um, the Pope can modify divine law from Ferrari's ecclesiastical dictionary. Now follows a little explanation about what is the word abrogate, because the Pope has the power to change times and to abrogate laws. Abrogate can be found in the dictionary and is explained as to abolish, to do away with, or annul, especially by authority. So, Tom, is there something you have to say up to here? Imagine a Protestant listening to this for the first time in his life would already understand what the Protestant Reformation was about. To think that any man, no matter what he calls himself, Pontifex Maximus, Pope, His Holiness, His Eminence, all the other blasphemous titles of the papacy, that would even think to have the authority to change God's times and laws. 
is worthy of protest. But that's what the Bible claims that the Antichrist would do. The little horn of Daniel would think to change times and abrogate laws, to do away with even the precepts of Christ. That's what the Pope claims to do. The Pope has the authority and often exercised it to dispense or to do away with the command of Christ. That's from a Roman Catholic, uh, uh, a Roman Catholic encyclopedia. The Pope can modify divine law. This is recorded in Ferris's Ecclesiastical Dictionary. Now, which one of you listening here would think to change one of God's times or laws? Well, you would immediately be overwhelmed with repulsion. Which one of us would think ourselves so holy as to change one single word that come out of God's mouth? It's abhorrent. But yet, that is the official law of the Roman Catholic Church that the Pope has the power even to dispense or to do away with the precepts of Christ. What are the precepts of Christ? The Bible, God's law, God's times, and his laws. And history is replete, and we're going to give examples as we continue reading this, example after example of how the Pope changed God's times and changed God's laws. And those are the laws and times that we're all subject to today. The civil power enforces, or is soon to enforce, the Pope's changes of God's times and laws. There's your Antichrist. No one else qualifies. It must be the Pope of Rome. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom, very much. So... The next picture that you will get in the video is a copy of a calendar published by the Vatican showing the change made by Pope Gregory XIII back in October 1582. Daniel's prophecy stated the beast would change times and laws. And as many already know, the Vatican did in fact change the calendar in the past. This, I am happy to say, is common knowledge among most living today. So when you look at the picture of the calendar of 1582, you see that the first uh, implemented Roman calendar on the world was, of course, uh, in reference to the solar system, uh, the Julian calendar, and that was changed by Pope Gregory XIII in 1582 in the month of October, where it went from Thursday, the 4th of October, the next day was Friday, the 15th of October. They took out 15 literal days just out of time. And why? Just because the Pope says, I can do it if I want it. The Pope has the power to change times and to abrogate laws. So I am the Pope, I have the power, and I just delete 11 days from the history of the world. Just from Thursday the 4th to Friday the 15th of October in 1582. This is how he changed the time. Many of us are also aware that the Vatican changed the Seventh-day Sabbath to Sunday as well. That is the main issue I would like to illustrate on this page. The prophecy of Daniel is 100% accurate on this point without a doubt. To illustrate this fact, I have a few facts I would like to make you aware of. Back in 1869, the Roman Catholic Church put out a letter that attacked the Protestant believers for their desire to keep to the word of God. In this letter that I have listed below and that we will be reading a little later on in the show, the Roman Catholic Church uses many Bible verses to prove, to prove beyond doubt that the Protestant churches are not doing as they should if they truly want to be considered Bible-believing Christians. In essence, their main argument was upon the seventh-day Sabbath, 
and that all Protestants were keeping a first-day Sabbath according to Rome, instead of the seventh-day Sabbath according to the Scriptures. The Vatican declared, and Rome, sorry, the Vatican declared, and Rome instead of the seventh. No, I'm, I'm wrong here. <laughs> I'm sorry. The Vatican declared and historically proved, I might add, that they are the ones that changed the Sabbath to Sunday, not the Bible. Yet all Bible-embracing Protestants were still attending church on Sunday anyway. So, Rome's challenge was that if you claim to be Protestants, why is it you are keeping a doctrine which Rome itself can prove with 100% accuracy she invented without a single Bible passage as proof of that change? The Vatican was declaring that since the Bible itself never allowed for the change, and they themselves had proved they made the change anyway, and Protestants the world over were doing as the Vatican suggested over what the Word commanded. They assumed the Vatican must be above the Bible because all the world was wandering after this beast. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought here. And uh, that all the world was wandering after this beast and doing as Rome declared was doctrine. And no Protestants bound by that which is written? Are they not bound to, quote, obey God rather than man, unquote, according to Acts chapter 5, verse 29? Yet, since we have historic proof as well as modern-day reality, we see the Protestants aren't really protesting at all. Well, I'm going to refer to my last video, um, Hour of the Truth. Um, the Protestants of today and the Antichrist. Watch that to understand the point here. They are doing as Rome suggests over and above that which the world commands. It appeared the Vatican had a case. Of course, the main issue of this challenge was to try and convert the Protestant into thinking as does the Catholic and therefore realize they may as well return to Mother Rome. They wanted them to realize that the Bible is not the quote-unquote sole authority and therefore not worthy of a trustworthy embrace. The Vatican thought they had quote-unquote proof the Protestants believed as they did regarding sola scriptura. The Vatican was hoping by this letter to convince the masses that the Catholic Church must be the true church because all of the Protestants were doing as she suggested in regarding to Sunday keeping. I'm sure this letter, as well as a series of articles that appeared in the Catholic Mirror, which, by the way, was an official organ of Cardinal Gibbons back in 1893, caused many to return to Rome as their home. However, the wonderful irony of this whole thing is, I'm also sure it backfired as well. This ministry, talking of remnantofgod.org, uh, Nicholas Ministry, alone, has seen many people come to know the truth about the Sabbath by merely sharing with them this admission of Rome that they are indeed the ones that thought they could change times and laws as Daniel prophesied the beast of Rome would do. So Tom, before we go into reading the letter from the Roman Catholic Church, I will gladly refer to the broadcast that we did earlier on nothing but the truth, the Sabbath question, why didn't the reformers go all the way? go through a few points there and a few questions there, and then I will go on reading that letter that the Roman Catholic Church published in 1869 to the Protestants in the United States of America, but now first, uh, your comment please on the things that I've just read. Yes, well, what we're uh, discussing is a lengthy and detailed letter written by a prelate of the Roman Catholic Church, literally uh, ridiculing the Protestants. And the Protestants who based their rebellion against the Roman Catholic Church and its ungodly traditions came out of the Roman Catholic Church and said, we don't believe the Pope anymore. He's the Antichrist. We don't follow Roman Catholic tradition because it contradicts the Scripture. We are going to go by the Bible and the Bible alone. Wonderful words. The Bible and the Bible alone. Sola Scriptura, that's where we ought to go. That's where the Protestants presented themselves to go. The Bible and the Bible alone. We don't need a pope. 
We don't need Roman Catholic canon law. We don't need Roman Catholic tradition. We hold to Christ and his word only. Wonderful. Except for one thing. In practice, they really didn't leave Roman Catholic tradition. They left some of the Roman Catholic apostasy, some of the Roman Catholic leaven in their new Protestant lump. And now the whole loaf is leavened. And Rome is ridiculing the Protestant Reformation as a conflicted error because they profess to go by the Bible and the Bible only, and yet maintained the Sabbath, the Sunday, the Roman Sabbath in tradition, when there is not a word of Scripture to justify it. The Bible maintains the seventh day. God never changed the Sabbath. Jesus never changed the Sabbath. The apostles never changed the Sabbath. And the early Christians observed the Sabbath, the seventh day. But Rome, the fourth century, changed the sanctity of Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day of the week. That is admitted by the Roman Catholic Church. It is a matter of record, a matter of Roman record that Constantine changed the tra- transferred the solemnity of the seventh-day Sabbath to the first day of the week. And it was done in order to make a visible distinction between the Romans and the Jews and the first-century Christians. Anyone caught going into a church or observing God's feasts or doing anything on the Saturday, on the seventh day, they were regarded as enemies of the state. They were regarded as Christ killers. And they were persecuted and killed, and their properties were taken in possession by the Roman Catholic Church to benefit the Roman Catholic Church, all their land, all their houses, all their belongings, and their children were taken from them and put in monasteries or under Roman authority, and they were killed. If you were caught observing the seventh day, you were regarded as a heretic Jew. And this is the very root of what is called anti-Semitism, which I prefer to call anti-Jewishness. <clears throat> and uh, this struck the fear of anybody whether they be Jew or Gentile, of observing the true Sabbath, the seventh day. You put your life in jeopardy if you were caught observing the true Sabbath. And, uh, and it might become, it, it might be uh, surprising for your listeners to realize that the early church kept the Sabbath, that there have always been Sabbatarians, as they are known, of even Protestant sects, the the the, uh, uh, the Seventh Day Baptists, there were many. Not just the Seventh Day Adventists; they're the most widely known. But there are many denominations of the Christian Church who maintain that the Seventh Day is the Sabbath, even to this day. They're an extreme minority, to be true, but nonetheless, they still hold to the Seventh Day Sabbath. But in the old world order, one was taking, one was signing his own death warrant if he were caught observing, just as Daniel was forbidden to pray to his God and was observed by King Nebuchadnezzar's servants as having been on his knees in prayer, on the, uh, in prayer he was hauled into uh, the court. Okay? The same is true of God's family today. If we're caught worshiping on the seventh day, we become the enemy of the state. It's just like it's, it's today, just like it was in the old world order. And it's going to be enforced. It's already happening. As, as the video will demonstrate that, that, uh, that Brother Yerk is going to put up on the, on the website. European Sunday Alliance. We've already discussed it. It's becoming law in Europe. You will observe Sunday. And anybody caught defying this authority is going to be sanctioned 
by the government. In Daniel's day, uh, it meant being turned over to the king for punishment, for praying. Today, it's going to be turned over to the civil power for observing the wrong day, God's holy Sabbath, the seventh day. So the Catholics had it right when they said, your protest is based on the Bible and the Bible only, yet you defied yourself when you maintain Sunday observance. Therefore, you are of no count. You have but one choice to make, and that is to return to the Roman Catholic Church. Your claim of the Bible and the Bible only, your claim of sola scriptura falls flat on its face because you still observe Roman Catholic tradition. What everyone agrees is Roman Catholic tradition, not scripture. And this letter is simply an overwhelming ridicule. It points out every part of scripture that Protestants believe sanctions the the observance of Sunday, and they prove beyond any reasonable argument that it is no such thing. The seventh day truly is the Sabbath of the Lord our God, and Rome proves it. And this is what the article is about. So be ready. Rome's going to ridicule the Protestant reformers for stepping out on the Bible and the Bible only and and yet maintain Roman Catholic traditions, thus defying their own faces. And we are living with the consequences for that error to this day. Over to you, Yerk. Sorry to be so long-winded about it, but I don't want people to miss the point because some of the some of the language in this this article can be confusing. I don't want anybody to be uh, confused about this. The issue is either the Bible or Roman Catholic tradition. You can't have it both ways. Common you sense serve, dictates. You Go cannot ahead, serve sir. two masters. You cannot serve two masters. And. I just want to go on the point of the Seventh-day Adventists. The Seventh-day Adventists are not the inventor of the Sabbath. God was the inventor of the Sabbath. The Seventh-day Adventists were just a remnant church that came out in 1844 or some of that time and held up the Seventh-day Sabbath. But don't forget about other uh, denominations, as Tom mentioned them before, and I want to mention one in particular. The Valdenses. The Valdenses are spoken of in Revelation, the church that went hiding into the wilderness for 1260 years, or three and a half prophetic years, or time, times and the dividing of time. They went into what is today called Switzerland, and they kept the seventh day Sabbath, and they went out from their hiding places into the world, into the northern of Italy, into the southern and even the north of Germany, and were preaching the gospel to the people. And that gospel also uh, uh, was containing the seventh day Sabbath. So this has nothing to do with the Seventh day Adventist Church. This goes back even to creation. But before I go on that, I want to mention again this uh, broadcast that we did on the Sabbath question. Why didn't the reformers go all the way? In that video, we will answer questions like the following. Is the Sabbath Jewish? Is the Sabbath abolished by Jesus Christ's new covenant? Is the Sabbath God's eternal law? Is Sunday the new Sabbath? And why didn't the reformers teach the Sabbath of the Bible? What was Luther's standpoint on the Bible? Did the reformers, by not emphasizing the Saturday day of rest, leave a door open for the Reformation to fail? There's a very interesting quote that can be found also in that broadcast that comes from John Theodore Mueller from his book Sabbath or Sunday, page 15 and 16. Quote, But they err in teaching that Sunday has taken the place of the Old Testament Sabbath, and therefore must be kept as the seventh day had to be kept by the children of Israel. These churches err in their teaching, for Scripture has in no way ordained the first day of the week in place of the Sabbath. 
There is simply no law in the New Testament to that effect. End quote. And there is another quote that I want to read that we spoke about in that broadcast, and that comes from a website, yashanet.com. It goes about the Protestant victory almost won but lost and why, and deals, of course, with the doctrines performed at the Council of Trent, held in the northeastern of Italy and lasting from 1545 to 1563 A.D., we must quote another well-versed writer, G. E. Fifield, D.D., in his incomparable act, tract, Origin of Sunday as a Christian Festival, published by American Sabbath Tract Society, Seventh-day Baptist Church. To quote Dr. Fifield, quote, At the Council of Trent, held by the Roman Catholic Church to deal with questions arising out of the Reformation, listen good, it was at first an apparent possibility that the council would declare in favor of the reformed doctrines instead of against them. So profound was the impression made thus far by the teachings of Luther and other reformers. End quote. Get this. The Council of Trent, organized by the, in 1540, acknowledged by the Pope Jesuit order, newfound Jesuit order, was in favor of the Reformed doctrines instead of against them. But now we will go on reading what turned them against us. I, I um, find that, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just find that um, as astounding. I, I, I did not realize, in all of my research, I did not realize that during the Council of Trent, it came push come to shove, and that the Council of Trent was ready to accept Protestant doctrine to do away with Roman Catholic tradition altogether and leave the Bible and the Bible alone as their, their instructor for faith and practice. I did not realize that the Council of Trent, the very Council of Trent, came just a hair's breadth away from becoming truly reformed and doing away with all these man-made laws and traditions and returning to the Scripture. But guess what turned the tide? The Protestants' failure to return to the true Sabbath. Had the Protestants returned to the true Sabbath, even the Roman Catholic Church may have dispensed with all of her man-made traditions. Only if the Protestants would have returned to the true Sabbath, the Roman Catholic Church at the Council of Trent was ready to accept Protestant teaching, the Bible, and the Bible only. But it was because they left just one part of Roman leaven in the Protestant lump, the Roman Catholic Church at the Council of Trent decided to enforce Roman Catholic tradition and even to overthrow Protestantism because of that one issue, the Sabbath. Amazing. Go ahead, Yerk. To go a little bit deeper in this, I just will continue reading here. The Pope's legate actually wrote to him that there was, quote, strong tendency <clears throat> to set aside tradition altogether and to make the scripture as the sole standard of appeal, unquote. The question was debated day by day until it was fairly brought to a standstill. Finally, the Archbishop of Reggio turned the council against the Reformation by the following argument. Listen closely. Quote, the Protestants claim to stand upon the written word only. They profess to hold the scriptures alone as the standard of faith. They justify their revolt by the plea that the church has apostatized from the written word and follows tradition. Now the Protestants claim that they stand upon the written word alone is not true. End quote. Why the Lutheran claim was not true will be made very clear 
in the next two quotes. Their profession of holding the scripture alone as the standard of faith is false. Proof? The written word explicitly enjoins the observance of the seventh day as the Sabbath. They do not observe the seventh day, but reject it. If they truly hold the scriptures alone as the standard, they would be observing the seventh day as it is enjoined in the scripture through, throughout. Yet, they not only reject the observance of the Sabbath as enjoined in the written word, but they have adopted and do practice the observance of Sunday, for which they have only the tradition of the Catholic Church. End of the first quote. And the second goes as this. Consequently, the claim of Scripture alone as the standard fails and the doctrine of Scripture and tradition as essential is fully established, the Protestants themselves being judges. See the proceedings of the Council of Trent, Augsburg Profession and Encyclopedia Britannica, Article Trent, Council of. At this argument, the party that had stood for the Scripture alone surrendered. And the council at once anonymously condemned Protestantism and the whole Reformation. It at once proceeded to enact stringent decrees to arrest its progress. End of the reading. And the Council of Trent ended with more than 100 anathemas against the Protestants. Now, as you have just heard, the Bishop of Reggio, a Roman Catholic bishop, pointed the finger to the Protestants and said, when you hold up the scripture and the scripture alone, which is the basis for your rebellion or your revolt against the Roman Catholic Church, then you should observe Saturday Sabbath and not mix it with the observance of Sunday for which they have you have only the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. Can it be made any clearer that up to 1545 to 1563, the Council of Trent, there was no question that Bible-believing Christians had to uphold the seventh-day Saturday Sabbath as he was created on the seventh day and hallowed by the God of the Bible? Can it be made any clearer? Do you have any doubts when you read this coming from the mouth of a Roman Catholic bishop himself? Can you really doubt that all the Christians in the first 15 centuries after Jesus Christ died on the cross, that keeping the Saturday Sabbath is wrong and that Sunday would be right? Tom, you have something to say to this, I guess? Yes. Out of the words of Rome herself, she called the Protestant observ observance of Sunday surrender. Rome surrendered the Protestants. Rome called them heretics simply because they continued to observe Roman tradition, Sunday. Rome proclaimed that the Protestants surrendered based on the fact that they still observed a tradition that can only be Roman, not biblical. On that basis alone, they declared the Protestant Reformation null and void and criminalized anybody who held to it. And they ended that council by issuing, as you said, over 100 damnations of every Protestant doctrine. Mixing Protestant the holy with the profane, huh? Yes. Yeah. They allowed a little bit of Roman leaven in the lump, and Rome used that as justification to overthrow the Protestant Reformation. Now, Without the ability to, to physically overthrow the Protestants, all they had to do was get control of the governments and through the civil law overthrow, overturn Protestantism. And that's what they're doing today. That's what they're doing today. 
our, our, according to Rome, the protest failed because they left a little Roman tradition in their beliefs, a tradition that is nowhere justified in the scripture that we call holy and as our only authority in faith and practice. We've defied our own faces. We have to admit as Protestants, Rome is right on this count. And Rome has acted. Rome has acted on this and is acting on it today. And in the case of the Bishop of Reggio, rightfully so. Absolutely. Because because mixing sola scriptura with Roman Catholic tradition is mixing the holy with the profane. That's exactly right. and, and, And haven't the people of uh, ancient Israel done the same thing and what was their punishment what did God say, God say when you follow Baal then you shall also serve Baal and he put them into Babylonian captivity and that is exactly where we are today in Roman captivity and Roman is nothing else than the continuation of Babylon we are in Babylonian captivity because we do not keep to the words that we speak. Right. And it is written, by their fruits you will know them. Not by what they say, but by what they do. Yeah. So when I say Scola Scriptura and I go to church on Sunday, am I really a Protestant? Am I really holding to the word of God? Am I hold, really holding to the Seventh-day Sabbath? Or am I mixing the holy with the profane. And what would be my punishment for that? Captivity. Exactly. That's where we're headed. That's exactly where we are today. We're going to lose all of our rights. Our rights will be dictated by our government, and our government serves the papacy, the Antichrist of the Bible. We are in no different a situation today than the Jews were when they were taken into Babylonian captivity. God simply said by his actions, if you wish to serve Baal, then to Babylon you will go. You want to mix the holy, the pristine worship of God Almighty and my my statutes and my decrees and my law with the worship of Baal and his law, then you go to Babylon to do it. Until you learn your lesson. That's exactly where we are today. History is repeating itself. Because the Protestants failed to purge the Roman leaven out of their loaf, we are now forced to serve the papacy. We are now forced by our government to observe Roman Catholic law and tradition. And nowhere is this more obvious than in Vatican Council II, which was simply an ultimatum to the Protestants. Time's up. You come back to the Mother Church. And if you don't, we're going to take over the government, which they already have, and they're going to make us Roman Catholic by force against our conscience and against the written word of God. We truly are in Babylonian captivity, only we weren't sent anywhere to be in Babylonian captivity. We simply, by our obstinance, disobedience, have invited Rome to come and here to overthrow us. You know, the Pope says when he comes in in, uh, this fall that he's come to speak on behalf of the American people. Who are the American people that he's to speak for? He certainly doesn't speak for Protestants. He speaks for Catholics. And also implied in his statement that if I don't speak for you, you're not a citizen of the United States. That's implied in what he said. He's coming to speak on behalf of the American citizen. Now, he doesn't speak for me. I don't agree with the thing he says. Therefore, I'm not an American citizen, according to the current pope. If I'm not an American citizen, then what am I? 
a rebel, a potential threat to this Roman government. That's what they intend to do to us. And it's simply a rehearsal of history. This is how Rome always persecuted God's people. You're a terrorist. They, they made them enemies of the state by taking over the government and then dictating what the people should believe. You're absolutely right, Walt. Domestic terrorists, that's what they're going to call us. A potential threat. Well, I'm not a threat to anyone but the Antichrist and his false doctrine. I don't preach violence. I don't practice violence. I simply use the Bible as the sword. That sword I wield both directions. And we have a lot of repenting to do. Or we will be subject to Rome. That's all there is to it. Rome has used the Protestants' error by continuing to observe Sunday as their justification for what we are suffering today. If you could boil the contention between Rome and the Protestant Reformation to one thing, it's our failure to stand completely and strictly upon the Scriptures. We profess with our mouth that the Bible and the Bible only is our instructor of faith and practice. Christ and Christ alone is our king. And then we continue to observe Roman Catholic tradition in spite of the Bible. That's exactly what I was going to say. Profess with the mouth one thing and the actions prove the other thing. Trying to serve two masters, which is in possible. They will catch you on that when you do this. And that is exactly what the Bishop of Reggio pointed out at the Council of Trent. When you profess to serve the Bible and the Bible alone, sola scriptura is your authority, then you don't also have to profess it, you also have to do it. And that's where the Protestants and where the Reformers also failed and as we are here on this broadcast always <laughs> pointing the finger at the errors of rome rome can do the same thing it can also point to the errors that a lot of protestants have and follow and rightfully so i mean what does the bible say don't judge um, uh, don't judge unless you will be judged you know so when you judge and you say, I judge on the authority of the Bible and God's word, then also according to God's word, you will be judged. What do you think God's word will judge you on when you profess with your mouth that you follow the Bible and follow your feet on Sunday to the Roman the Catholic or Protestant or whatever church on Sunday? What do you think God will think of that? Okay, I'm going to read now the letter from the Roman Catholic Church. <clears throat> This is a letter originally published in America in 1869. The message was written to Protestants and is forceful and to the point with lots of scriptural proofs for its position. So please, Tom, whenever you feel to interrupt me in the reading to go directly into a deeper explanation, please do so. Quote, I'm going to propose a very plain and serious question to those who, quote, follow the Bible and the Bible only, unquote, to give their most earnest attention. It is this, why do you not keep holy the Sabbath day? The command of Almighty God stands clearly written in the Bible in these words, quote, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. 
unquote. Exodus 20, verses 8 to 10. And again, quote, Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be unto you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. End quote. From Exodus 35, uh, verses 2 and 3. How strict and precise is God's commandment upon his, this head in this matter. No work whatever was to be done on the day which he had chosen to set apart for himself and to make holy. And accordingly, when the children of Israel, quote, found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day, unquote, the Lord said unto Moses, the man, the man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp, unquote. Taken from Numbers uh, 15 verses 32 through 35. Such being God's command, then I ask again, why do you not obey it? Why do you not keep holy the Sabbath day? Well, you will answer me perhaps that you do keep holy the Sabbath day, for that you abstain from all worldly business and diligently go to church and say your prayers and read your Bible at home every Sunday of your lives. But Sunday is not the Sabbath day. Sunday is the first day of the week. The Sabbath day is the seventh day of the week. Almighty God did not give a commandment that men should keep holy one day in seven, but he named his own day and said distinctly, quote, thou shalt keep holy the seventh day, unquote. And he assigned a reason for choosing this day rather than any other a reason which belongs only to the seventh day of the week and cannot be applied to the rest. He says, quote, For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus 20, uh, verse 11. Do, do, do the listeners gather up the significance of what he said? I hope. He said six days... God made the heavens and the earth the sea. In other words, he didn't stop in the middle of those six days and take a rest. He didn't stop on Wednesday and take a rest. He didn't rest Sunday. He didn't rest Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. He rested Saturday, the seventh day. Now, there's, you know, when this issue comes up between me and, and Sunday observers, well, I worship God every day. No. The Bible says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that, is, that in them is, and he rested the seventh day. Yes, I worship God every day, but I rest on the seventh day, not one of the six days. So the argument that I can worship any day I want, or that Christ is my Sabbath, and I can choose whatever day I want, including Sunday, falls flat on its face. It is intellectually dishonest for any Christian to say there is a Sabbath except for the seventh day. I've heard all the arguments. I've heard them all a million times. There is literally no justification for the observance of any day but the seventh day. God left no room for error here. He covered all the bases. He covered them all. All you have to do is read the Bible. He covered all the bases. There's but one day that he rested. It was the seventh day. Six days he worked. The seventh day he rested. That was he, his signature on the creation. That that's is right. something that, that is something that people do not understand. Because, <clears throat> sorry, Adam was created the sixth day. He didn't see God creating anything, but he was created the sixth day. And therefore, God ordained the seventh day as a day of rest, because at that day, he signed the creation to him and him alone. He was the one 
responsible for creating everything, creating the heavens and the earth, the water, the plants, the animals, and man. And the seventh day, the seventh day rest that he hallowed was to sign for the creation. I worked six days and the seventh day is my sign of the creation. And that's why I'm resting. And that's why men also should have rested. Because, you know, Adam didn't work six days before. And he was created on the sixth day. But he rested the day after. The second day of his life. He rested. You can be sure of that. Come on, Tom. You got anything else or shall I continue here? Oh, I just, I just double everything you say. <laughs> and, 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 and also this argument, well, that was for the Jews. Remember, the Sabbath was, in, was instituted before there was ever a Jew. Before there was ever a Jew. It was to be a perpetual covenant, a perpetual commandment to be observed by everyone. Jew and Gentile alike. The Bible acknowledges that 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 uh, Adam was the father of all living, all living, not just the Jews. And he was to observe the seventh day and the seventh day only. And those who observed the Sabbath observed the seventh day, and not any other day. Okay, the heathen had their own day because they were in rebellion against God. In the ancient Babylonian worship, they worshiped the sun on the venerable day of the sun, which we know today as Sunday. Rome literally keeps the traditions of ancient Babylon in direct rebellion against the command of the Lord. And Protestants who claim that The Bible and the Bible only is their authority, sole authority in faith and practice. Observe Sunday, Rome's tradition, Babylonian tradition. The venerable day of the sun that they venerated in ancient pagan Babylon. We are to rest because our creator rests. That's the way we identify with him. Certainly you understand that if, that if you observe the seventh day as commanded by the Lord, you are in an extreme minority in the world today. Does that bring more understanding to the phrase in the Bible that says the whole world wonders after the beast? The whole world wonders after the beast? Even the Christian world? Even the Protestant world wonders after the beast. I'll tell you, Yerk, when this first came to my understanding, I was sick. I was sick to my stomach. I was sick in my soul. I was sick in my heart. That every day that I observed Sunday, I was simply observing the customs and traditions of ancient Babylon. I committed the same sins as Israel did. And without my knowledge, where would I go to find the truth? Certainly in the churches. The only place you can expect to hear the truth is in the churches. But what did the church teach me? Roman Catholic tradition, not God's law. And now I find myself at odds with the whole world because the whole world wonders after the beast. But I maintain God worked six days and he rested the seventh. That is the perpetual covenant to be observed by all the living of every distinction. The seventh day. It's God's mark upon us. That's how we are identified. Obviously, there are other things that identify us as children of the Father, but certainly the observance of his day of rest, especially when the Roman Catholic Church talks about creation but believes in evolution. Okay? This is the crux of the matter. 
This is the breach in the wall. This is where we have failed, just as ancient Israel failed. They received the law of God, but they obeyed another master. We're guilty of the same sin, and every one of us should be on our faces in repentance before the Lord. I've returned to the biblical Sabbath at the expense of losing fellowship with my entire family and all my other friends and fellowship with the world. When you observe God's holy Sabbath, you better become accustomed with solitude. And you better be comfortable with being at odds with the entire world because the whole world wanders after the beast. Back to you, Yerk. I continue reading now the letter from the Roman Catholic Church to the Protestants from 1869. Almighty God ordered that all men should rest from their labor on the seventh day because he too had rested on that day. He did not rest on Sunday, but on Saturday. On Sunday, which is the first day of the week, he began the work of creation. He did not finish it then. It was on Saturday that he, quote, ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, unquote. Genesis 2, verse 2. Nothing can be more plain and easy to understand than all this, and there is nobody who attempts to deny it. There is nobody who attempts to deny this. It is acknowledged by everybody that the day which Almighty God appointed to be kept holy was Saturday, not Sunday. Why do you then keep holy the Sunday and not Saturday? You will tell me that Saturday was the Jewish Sabbath. God gave the Bible Sabbath to mankind 2,000 years before the first Jew ever existed. But that the Christian Sabbath was been, has been changed to Sunday? Changed? By whom? Who has authority to change and express commandment of Almighty God? When God has spoken and said, Thou shalt keep holy the seventh day, who shall dare to say, Nay, thou mayest work and do all manner of worldly business on the seventh day, but thou shalt keep holy the first day in its stead? This is a most important question, which I know not how you can answer. You are a Protestant, and you profess to go by the Bible and Bible only, and yet in so important a matter as the observance of one day in seven as a holy day, you go against the plain letter of the Bible and put another day in the place of that day which the Bible has commanded. The command to keep holy the seventh day is one of the Ten Commandments. You believe that the other nine are still binding, but who gave you authority to tamper with the fourth? If you are consistent with your own principles, if you really follow the Bible and the Bible only, you ought to be able to produce some portion of the New Testament in which this fourth commandment is expressly altered. End of the reading of the letter from the Roman Catholic Church to the Protestants to point out the same error that the Bishop of Reggio pointed out at the Council of Trent some 200 years before. I'm really serious right now, dear listener and dear viewer of the video. These words I've just read to you and Tom and I explained to you come right out of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, in a very long letter here, explains that the only reason for keeping Sunday is the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. So they point out that when you observe Sunday as the holy day of the week, as the weekly Sabbath, then you are following Roman tradition. So ask yourself one question. Do you want to serve the Lord 
or do you want to serve the Pope? Do you want to serve the Antichrist sitting in Rome and obeying his law? Or are you in agreement with the Bible and with the, with the word of the Lord and want to keep his commandments? Jesus said, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And as the letter ends here, the command to keep holy the seventh day is one of the Ten Commandments. The commandment of the seventh day rest is the fourth of Ten Commandments of the eternal moral law God gave at creation to humanity. And he said, my words never change. My laws never change. Time will pass. This earth will pass. My word and my laws will not change. So when you still think, you should not lie. You should not steal. You should not commit murder. You should not covet. You should not make any idols. You should not use the name of your God, thy Lord, in vain. When you still are honoring your father and your mother, when you keep all of the other nine commandments, why are you always questioning the fourth? Well, I can tell you why you are doing this. But you surely do not want to know why. Because it is so comfortable. Everybody does it. How can it be wrong if everybody does it? Have you ever thought about that the majority is always wrong? Have you ever thought the majority rather follows the Pope, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn sitting on the city of seven hills, given power to by the dragon and follows them and follows him. And you want to follow him or you want to follow the lamb whithersoever he goes. That decision is up to you. That decision is up to you. But don't profess with your word that you take the Bible and the Bible alone as your authority and then go to church on Sunday. For there is no scriptural reference that Sunday is the day of worship. Okay, Tom, I need your help right now. I think I've expanded a little bit about my, <laughs> my explanation here, but I would really yes. like to say, uh, to hear your closing comment on on this letter from the Roman Catholic Church to the Protestants? Well, I reiterate everything that you just said. The admonition is clear. The Bible lays forth the standard for faith and practice. It's up to us to decide. But I'll tell you, there's a consequence for making the wrong decision. If you should decide, like the rest of the world, to follow the dictates of Rome and the traditions of Rome, there are consequences. And the consequence is this. If you accept the papacy as your authority for faith, faith and practice, as given in the example of the Sunday observance by Protestants, you must accept the Pope's temporal power. You must submit to his temporal or kingly authority as well. And that means the overturn of all your Protestant liberties. Are you losing your Protestant liberties? The freedom to speak out against the Pope and the King? Your freedom of conscience to follow the Bible and the Bible only? Are you losing your rights in this country? Does the Patriot Act attack any of those Protestant liberties embodied in our Constitution? Indeed, they do. Our government is overthrowing our Protestant liberties because we keep 
Roman tradition. We accept the Pope's authority by doing so, and we voluntarily submit to all of Rome's authority, even his kingly power. And the evidence is facts, observable facts on the ground. Our government is taking away our liberties, our constitutionally protected liberties embodied in the Bill of Rights. Those are Protestant liberties given to us by Protestants in the early founding of this country. You see, it's really happening. All that we assert is already visibly observable. The consequences are real, and they are being emplaced right now. You can't profess with your mouth Jesus Christ and then serve Antichrist with your hands and your feet. If you acknowledge him, he will tyrannize you and virtually make it impossible to worship God. That's what Pharaoh did. Made it virtually impossible for God's people to worship God. And so God had to liberate them. That's where we are. That's where we are. I think I've said all I need to say today. I think you were very clear, Tom. I want to refer to the reading that you did on First Amendment Radio on the book from Dave Hunt, A Woman Rides the Beast. Um, oh, now I lost my thought. <laughs> I was, I was uh, listening to that broadcast over and over again the last days when I was in the car. And um, the only thing that, that I want to close with here is to say then, uh, because I lost my train now, sorry for that. A train of thought. Isn't it amazing how the Roman Catholic Church in this letter to the Protestants over and over again admits that they were wrong? And now that, that reminded me of the broadcast. You were speaking about the donation of Constantine yes. in that book. And that donation of Constantine has been exposed as a forgery in the late 1400s, in the 15th century. Yes. And nobody in the Roman Catholic Church today denies it is a forgery. But still, they continue to do as they do, even they know that everybody also knows, and everybody who can study it, that it was a lie. And that is not the only lie that the Roman Catholic Church was based upon, because, you know, the... Um, the donation of Constantine was that uh, Emperor Constantine in 300-something gave more than 20 cities, papal cities, papal grounds, to the Bishop of Rome. And this donation is wrong. And that explained the temporal and spiritual power that the Pope of Rome had at that time. That was the rising of the little horn, right? Before it came to full yes, power indeed. in 538. Yes, that's, that's, when the, that's when the Bishop of Rome became not just a spiritual authority, but, a but he became authority. a temporal king as well. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's the authority that he claims over the governments of the world right. today, including the European, the European Commission and the Congress of the United States. So when mm -hmm. you see the Pope of Rome addressing Congress, you're seeing the king of kings and Lord of Lords dictating to our civil government what it shall do. He's exercising the authority that he gained, that he claims to have gained, at uh, the issuance of the donation of Constantine. Which is a forgery. And by which that is an admitted forgery. The well, Roman that, Catholics, yeah. the Roman, Roman Catholic theologians and and scholars were the ones that discovered that the donation of Constantine from beginning to end was a forgery. No and legitimacy way, to it at all. And in a way, that is exactly the same thing the Protestants do today. 
when they worship on Sunday instead of Saturday. Yes, Protestants don't realize that when they go to church on Sunday, believing in its service to the Lord, they are actually contradicting the Lord, and they are, they are venerating the Antichrist. They deny the word of God by putting any foot of themselves into any church in the world on Sunday. That's right. So that means, and that is also the point the Bishop of Reggio made in the famous Council of Trent that we were talking about earlier, that you profess on the one hand that the scripture and the scripture alone is your basis of authority, but you act another way. So that means that Protestants say, well, I do, not, I do not believe this and this and this and this teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. I don't accept the Mass. I don't accept the Eucharist. I don't accept the conf, uh, confiscation, by, uh, what's it called, confession box or whatever. But I go on Sunday to the church. They are denying the word of God by keeping Sunday and not Saturday. And the Roman Catholic Church, in this letter from 1869, made this very, very clear. And don't forget, dear viewer and listener to this program, the letter that we wrote came from the Roman Catholic Church itself, stating over and over and over again that there is no scriptural authority to observe Sunday as the weekly day of rest. Now, the broadcast is now over. I will bring it to an end. Thank you very much, Tom, for your contribution today. And you, listener and viewer, please stay on, even though the title will come. After this title, there will come the video that uh, I was speaking about, about um, the European Sunday Alliance, and you can watch for yourself how in Europe they made a video that runs on television right now to explain to you that they will make Sunday a day of rest for all the working people. I mean, communism at its best. So we are closing the broadcast right now, but there will follow a video of five or six minutes. Please, wa please watch that, and I guess you will be astonished when you see that with your own eyes and you can read what is written in there and what is said in there. So once again, Tom, thank you very much for your contribution. You got some closing remarks before we close down? I just beg the indulgence of the listeners to take seriously what we've said. Look up the scriptures and see for yourself. There's no biblical justification for Sunday. And uh, in doing so, we're just keeping a tradition of the Antichrist. As strong words, I know, but nonetheless true. And um, I'm I, thankful for the invitation to come and speak. Thank you, Bjork, and thanks, Walt, for providing the, uh, the uh, program. I'm back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom, for your visit and your explanation that you gave. And uh, thank you, Walt, uh, to send up uh, this broadcast on uh, the platform GrandDesignExposedTalkShoe.com. Never forget GrandDesignExposed.com, a very important website that you can study on. And, of course, the page Hour of the Truth that is embedded in there and where you can follow all our broadcasts that we have had here. And, of course, you can switch to my YouTube channel, Jogla66, to watch the videos that I will make out of this broadcast. And as I announced right now, thank you very much for listening. And here now comes the video on the European um, Sunday Alliance. Thank you very much for listening. Until the next time, God bless you. Bye-bye.
in a work, work, work world. What difference will one day make? The Earth won't alter its course. Cats and dogs will be cats and dogs. Rain will still fall from the sky. So take time for Sunday. Just know that your truck has a little thing for Monday. Knives, or you can use whatever. It's the soul that is corrupt, and how we get back to a moral rebirth in this country, I don't know, since we are slowly eroding religion at every opportunity that we have. Uh, probably we should be debating a bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday to see if we can get back to having a 